What were the biggest surprises from the Denver Broncos on the offensive side in the first half of the season, and what must they do better in the second half? Well, you're going to get all that and much more in today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. It's not quite school for the Denver Broncos, but we're going through and taking a look at the report card from the first half of the season on the Broncos offense, the Broncos defense. That's the installment you're going to get here during the bye week blues on a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country. A special shout out to all the everydayers out there. Thank you so much for rocking with us, making us your first listen of the day. Every single day, just a reminder, you can get this podcast every single day, all year long for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. I'm Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter for Mile High Sports, joined alongside as always by Sarah Bettinger, site expert, predominantlyorange.com. Broncos country, the NFL world is crazy as we all know it. The Broncos not playing this week. They get a much deserved, well needed bye week at just the right time coming off of a victory against the Kansas City Chiefs. The AFC West is changing. The Raiders are making changes. It's been a crazy 48 hours here around the NFL here. But more importantly, I think we got to go back and we got to reflect on the first half of the season, particularly with this Broncos offense. We're going to look at surprises. We're going to look at disappointments. And we're going to talk about maybe what we want to see a little bit more of in the second half. So, Sarah, let's start off with like the biggest surprises so far from when we talk about this Broncos offense, which has had its moments through the first eight weeks of the season. What were the biggest first half surprises? Give, you know, whether it's a player, whether it was a development, in your opinion, what would you start off with here? I think we got to start off with the most obvious, Cody. But before I do, I just want to say, you know, crazy almost 13 years to the day, Josh McDaniels fired by the Raiders. I mean, that is almost it's it's almost too bizarre. Remember the game against the 49ers was October 30th, 2010. He was fired in the beginning of December, 13 years almost exactly to the date. Pretty bizarre, and he almost lasted the exact amount of time. But for the Denver Broncos, offensively, what was surprising and what has been surprising, what continues to surprise to the point that maybe this guy is going to be a lot richer in the very near future, Lloyd Cushenberry the third at the center position, right? I mean, not only is he passing the eye test, but the analytics folks over there at Pro Football Focus are loving him, highlighting him pretty much every single week, especially when it comes to pass protection. And I think as we saw last season when, you know, Butch Berry was the offensive line coach, things were not good on the interior offensive line for the Denver Broncos, right? Lloyd Cushenberry seemed to be getting victimized almost weekly. And I, I say that not to be harsh on him or anything, but it's just the reality. Kind of felt like he was getting bowled over at times by opposing defensive linemen and the Broncos had a real weakness there. Now it looks like the interior offensive line is a real strength for this team, and Lloyd Cushenberry is a big reason for that. So I guess shout-out is really warranted right now for the coaching staff in Denver for believing in Cushenberry, not just rushing to replace him. I know that was one of the discussions we had all throughout the offseason. So I think he's been arguably the biggest individual surprise for this team on offense. I think it might even be fair to say when we look at the offense in terms of most improved player from last year to this year, I think Cush is definitely that guy. And look, it's I think it's also a great reminder at times too, Sarah, is that player development is so important in the NFL, right? When Cush came in as a rookie, you know, obviously very smart coming out of the LSU national championship offense, struggled with the physical strength for the first couple of years of his career. And all of a sudden now he's playing the best football of his career. You can make an argument. He's the Broncos best offensive lineman alongside Quinn Miners this season. Those guys work well together, and I think the addition of Ben Powers has been so huge for them. So, in turn, Denver did upgrade the offensive line, and now you're getting good play out of the guards, and you're getting it out of the center, which I think is absolutely paramount in terms of today's NFL because how many times in the last couple of years have we been talking about, like, interior pressure has just been hurting the Broncos' offense, been hurting the quarterbacks. You're not necessarily worried about the outsides because you have a quarterback who's mobile enough to step up and dip out, but when you have that pressure coming from the inside, it's hard to make those adjustments. So, I agree with you. I think Cush has been a huge surprise, and I would not be shocked if he gets a contract extension. I think he would he deserves it, in my opinion. I think he's the best man for the job right now. I don't think there's anybody else out there right now that would come in and replace what he's doing. Big, big step forward from him. I'm going to be a little cliche here. Right? I, I love the underdog story. I'm going to go with Jaleel McLaughlin. I mean, Sarah, he's been 
he's been a huge surprise. And this goes all the way back to Broncos rookie minicamp when he was trying out. And obviously they had a couple of undrafted guys there. Emmanuel Wilson, who is now with the Green Bay Packers. Like we were looking at that and we we're saying, okay, hey, it's going to be between these two guys. Like, could one of these guys be an undrafted gem? Well, it turns out Jaleel McLaughlin is for real. And just his vision, his flash, and just how explosive he is and how consistent he is there. It's an exciting wrinkle to add here to this offense. And look, Sean Payton has even hinted that he's not quite there yet, but Jalil can be that joker that he used with Kamara. He used with Reggie Bush back in the day. So for me, I like that. I think jalil has been a little bit of a stud surprise here. And then obviously, you know, I think a guy that we've been, you know, kind of challenged a little bit. Like, you know, we said like, hey, he's got to go out there and he's got to be the guy. Cortland Sutton's also been a huge surprise here in the first half of the season. Six touchdown catches before the bye week. Like, that's huge. And I think if you look at his stats, people are like, well, he doesn't have that many yards. It's not about that. It's about production. It's about efficiency. And he's being very efficient. He is being very efficient, Cody. And I think CBS, I'm thankful that they finally highlighted this because I've been searching for wherever you find this stat. I don't know where they found it, but he has drawn the second most pass interference penalties since 2019 of any receiver in the NFL. And remember, he missed an almost an entire season there in 2020. So Cortland Sutton, although, yes, the yardage isn't exactly what you would expect of a true wide receiver one. He's not, you know, blowing anybody's doors off in terms of those numbers. I think where he's making an impact is, is almost hidden in some ways. Like, he's a very good blocker. That oftentimes goes unrecognized. And he's drawn a lot of penalties which oftentimes goes unrecognized. And I also think now we're seeing that he is able to be that guy in the red zone that you can rely on. Not that we're necessarily seeing him consistently body people like, right. He's getting open in the back of the end zone, pretty consistent, but Cortland Sutton is finally developing back into that guy that we saw in 2019. The guy that we've been begging to see for the last couple of years, quite frankly, on this podcast. And so I would say, his development, so to speak, I don't know if you want to say that he's a he's a veteran, he's a captain, but his progression this year has been a bit of a surprise given what we've seen the last couple of seasons and kind of even where we were at the beginning of the year or towards the beginning of the year, especially after that Miami game where we're kind of like, man, is this guy in his own head, right? I mean, what is going on out there? Uh, is Should he even be playing over some of these other guys? Now we're seeing him develop, I guess, into that true wide receiver one where he's the go-to guy in the passing attack. And, and that's ultimately what you want to see. And I think the way that Sean Payton plans to utilize him, I, I think is very important because it, he's a big body, right? And, and he's got a skill set that not many NFL wide receivers consistently possess. So I, I think if you look around the league at times, how many truly big bodied wide receivers do we see, right? There's Cortland, there's DK. I'm trying to think of some other like big body guys, Mike Evans. But most of the time, you have a lot of finesse players at the position around the league. And obviously, there's value in what they do, but you need those big body guys in today's game. And obviously, with Cortland Sutton, we've seen him in two straight games against the Kansas City Chiefs, absolutely moss the Chiefs defender. You need to see that. Like, that's obviously the biggest thing when the guy's on the sideline. And you know, when Tim Patrick's getting jacked up on the sideline, that there's some real funny, you know, good stuff going on right there. So I I'm with you there. I think that Cortland's been a big surprise. I think Jalil's been a surprise. I'd even say maybe even Russell Wilson, right? Russ has had a couple of games where it's like, ah, you know, he didn't play his best, but Russ has taken a big step forward in comparison to where he was at last season. Already has his touchdown totally had all of last year. Like that is a positive step forward here. And we'll see if the Broncos offense can keep building on that here. But Broncos country, one thing we are going to talk about too, all right? We talked about in this segment, we talked about players who were big surprises. What were some disappointments from the Broncos offense in the first half of the season? You're going to get all that on today's brand new episode. Locked on Broncos. Today's episode of Locked on Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at DoorDash. And folks, whenever the game clock stops, that's time to order in with DoorDash. Get all of your local favorites delivered directly to your doorstep on game day. So you don't have to go out there and pick something up. They bring it directly to you. Now, if you're in the Denver area, some local favorites that I personally love, you've heard me mention Illegal Pete's several times. My go-to is obviously a protein-packed burrito with double protein chicken and steak. On, on top of that, rice with a little bit of queso inside of it, or you can never go wrong with one of their quesadillas as well. It's fantastic. It's fresh, and that's what I usually get if I'm watching the Denver Nuggets play, or if the Broncos are on the road, DoorDash is my daily go-to on game days. Order pizza, wings, soda, burgers, or even just the buns on DoorDash, and get it all delivered without missing the game. Kick back at kickoff with unbeatable deals on everything that you need for the watch party 
or tailgate and score football season's best deals on groceries, restaurants, retail, and more. Get prepared before game day. Stock up on your favorite appetizers and order all of your tailgate gear on DoorDash. Then get ready to watch your team win. Get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and you enter code LOCKED23. Subject to change, terms apply. Once again, get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. Subject to change, terms apply. We talked about biggest surprises. Now we got to go kind of to the negative side of things. Some disappointments in the first half of the season for the Denver Broncos offensively. And we want to know from you, who do you think has been surprising this season offensively? Who's been disappointing to you? Drop it in the comments if you're watching on YouTube or always you can reach out to Cody and I on Twitter. And we want to give a huge shout out to every single one of you that does engage with the podcast, engage with Cody and I, comments on YouTube or especially if you subscribe to the channel, if you listen anywhere and everywhere that you can find podcasts and you subscribe to the podcast that way, however you choose to make us part of your day, we can't thank you enough, especially you everydayers out there who rock with Locked On Broncos every single day. And don't forget to make us your first listen every day. Cody, I'm excited to talk about this because I think there's room for improvement always. And, and you, you've got to identify maybe some of the issues that have been going on over the course of the first half of the season offensively. As we talk about surprises, which, you know, has a very positive connotation, disappointments, which obviously is on the other side of the coin. I, I think there's been some, I mean, maybe surprising disappointments in quite frankly, we could have included some of these guys in the surprise section, but disappointing. Who's disappointed you offensively this season? Or maybe it's a, a, a facet of the offense. Maybe it's coaching. Maybe it's whatever it is. What, what's been disappointing for you so far in 2023? Well, you know, I think we have to look at the production that we have seen from the Broncos tight end position here, Sarah. I mean, obviously, we didn't factor in coming to the season that Greg Dulcich was going to get hurt in week one and that he would get hurt when he comes back. And I think we had high expectations like, hey, Greg Dulcich made it through the entire training camp and preseason. He's fully healthy. Okay, that's a great sign. And then week one, bang, it just it just happens. And then against the Chiefs, bang, week six, it happens again. And all of a sudden, I think that right there, and that's beyond Greg Dulcich's control. And that's always one thing I want to pinpoint. Like, it's not Dulcich's fault that he got hurt. It's just unfortunate. It's just the, the downside and the negative effects of being a guy with such big body, body size, body type, and also the athleticism that he possesses. But also, more importantly, I just think it's the, it's the guys behind Greg Dulcich, Sarah. Like, to me... You and I have kind of beat this horse into oblivion that, you know, the dead horse here about the tight end position that you just need a guy who's got size and speed there. Like you have to have a passing threat at this position and Denver simply just doesn't have that. Adam Troutman is not a guy who's going to be a vertical passing threat for you, though. He can be a guy that maybe if you sit him at the sticks and you get him on a tight end screen, like I think he can do some things, but defensive coordinator is not sitting there drawing up their game plan saying, all right, we need to figure out, okay, when 82 is lined up, we need to figure out how we're going to cheat our assets to that side like there's no threat possession there really for other defensive coordinators everybody else is like all right hey we gotta stop number 10 we gotta stop number 14 and then we're gonna be ideal that's the mindset of nfl defenses and how they play denver so for me i would just say the tight end position the lack of production there and obviously we know that they brought in chris manhurst to be a blocker so i think maybe the saving grace if i'm playing devil's advocate here the one positive thing i can say about tight end is that okay they're going more heavy looks, and they're obviously adding Quinn Bailey in as an eligible guy from time to time to where now Denver's focus has been on the run game, and the run game has been good. So I think if I'm going to sit here and say, like, I'm disappointed in the tight end position, though I will say they have helped out in the run game in the last couple of weeks, and hopefully if they can maintain that going forward, that'll be a huge thing. But for me, that's one of the biggest things in terms of when I look at it where I find a little bit of disappointment. How do you feel about it? And then is there any other areas of disappointment on the offense that you want to pinpoint? Yeah, I think to your point, Cody, it's really about the production in the passing game for the tight end position, right? It's they're doing their jobs in the running game for the most part, as far as what we can see. And I think that's great. I think that's part of what why these guys were brought in. That's why Sean Payton wanted Chris Manhurts. That's why he wanted to bring in Adam Troutman, who's a more kind of balanced player at the position. But yes, you are lacking that athletic option in the passing game without Greg Dulcich. And that really does limit your options. Like you said, if, if teams are able to take away Judy and Sutton on a particular passing play, there's just not much to do other than dump the ball off to the running backs, which we have seen 
in a lot of games this season. I mean, the running backs are very involved in the passing game, and that's that's fine. But you just kind of wish that you could see a little bit more there. And the tight end position is really the reason, in my opinion, why you're lacking in that regard. I want to shift it over just a little bit to the right tackle position, right? Obviously, Mike McGlinchey was the team's biggest acquisition in free agency from a pure dollars perspective, right? They signed him to a big five-year deal, the only unrestricted free agent in all of free agency for any team to sign a five-year contract. So the pressure was on Mike McGlinchey to begin with, just financially. Then you add in the fact that it seems like the Broncos simply can't find anybody to play the right tackle position at a competent level. And I think the expectation level gets raised quite a bit for somebody like McGlinchey to come in and say, hey, you're coming from San Francisco where you were dominant offensively. You're coming from a, a place where, hey, you were a first round pick and, and all these sorts of things. Now you got a big money contract. You're expected to kind of break this curse, so to speak, at the right tackle position. Unfortunately, Cody, I hate to I hate to say this, but I mean, he's earned the nickname from a lot of fans, McFlinchy, for having about uh, one false start penalty per game. And that stinks. You, you don't want any sort of reason to be talking negatively about McGlinchey each week. And I will say, I think he's done well in the running game. But unfortunately, he's also put this team in some really tough positions with penalties and, and with inconsistent pass protection. I don't know. To you, what's your perspective on that? I know you're around the team every day. Do you feel like McGlinchey has been a disappointing signing in free agency given how much money the Broncos spent up to this point? Yeah, you know, I would say the start hasn't been the greatest, right? And I think the good thing about football, and there's a cliche saying that we always say as coaches and, and as media members, it's not how you start, it's how you finish, right? And so I think, hey, now you have a second half schedule coming up, you're going to have a good chance, but also you're going to face some pretty dang good pass rushers in the second half stretch of the schedule here. Now, I will say this. I agree with you on McGlinchey in the run game. I think he's been pretty solid there in that regard. I'm with you on the fact that I just think in pass protection, consistency has been the issue. There's times he does a really great job. There's times where he gets beat and obviously allows a big play. And obviously the penalties, as you mentioned, holding, ball starts. Like, you know, those are things that have impacted, I think, the optics of him negatively. I do think in the last two weeks, right? And obviously, maybe no coincidence, the Broncos 2 and 0 in the last two weeks which is nice. We haven't been able to talk about that for quite some time. I think he's made gradual improvements because for me, I was really curious. Okay, that game against Kansas City on Thursday night football, that was a rough game for McGlinchey, especially going against Chris Jones. They moved him over there once again to McGlinchey's side, and he actually did a really good job. And obviously, it was a group effort between him, the tight ends blocking, Quinn Bailey coming over and helping out. I liked what I saw. And, and look, if he can continue to take positive steps forward, it'll be good. But has the signing gotten off to a good start here for McGlinchey? No, not this season. But I would say the one thing I really like about McGlinchey, there is a lot of self-accountability there. You know, he talks about, you know, just how he needs to be better. And look, I, I get it. Like a lot of fans don't want to hear that. They're like, oh well, yeah, well, we don't want to hear it. We want to see it. Like, obviously that's the goal. That's the intention. But McGlinchey genuinely means it. You know, he does a lot of self-reflection. I think that comes with his experience as a veteran, as a leader, as a team captain. And I think you have to build on that. And I think certainly he's going to, and he's going to get coached up by Sean Payton. He's going to get coached up by Zach Streif. But yeah, that's got to be an area where he's got to be 110% better going into the second half stretch of the schedule, which look, look, now you get to open up, you get to play against Von Miller. Like, oh, that's going to be a challenge. Gregory Russo. I mean, they have a, a multitude of guys there in Buffalo that can get after the quarterback on the interior and also on the outside. So I'm very, very curious to see what will you know kind of transpire in that regard here. But no, I'm with you there in terms of disappointments. Can he find a way to bounce back? I think there's certainly, you know, an aspect to that. I, I don't even throw an honorable mention out there. I think that the Broncos decision and the identity from a play calling standpoint through at least like the first five weeks has been disappointing just because we've been saying run the football, right? And they finally get to it. They're two and zero when they run the football and have an emphasis on that. I just don't know why in some of those games, you know, the Miami one excluding Denver could have ran the ball a little more. The, the Raiders game in week one is a little different because each team had six possessions, but there was never really a true commitment to the run game. And there's still times where they go away from it when I think they should stick with it. So that kind of falls into that co category here. But Broncos country, one thing we are going to talk about is what do we want to see from the Broncos offense in the second half stretch of the schedule? Well, you're going to get all that on today's brand new episode, Lockdown Broncos. Today's Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at Prize Picks, And Prize Picks is daily fantasy sports 
done right. Prize picks is the most fun that I've had winning up to 25 times my money this football season. You just select two or more players, you pick more or less on their projected stats, and then you place your entry. With the basketball season here now, you can now pick a combo projections across football and basketball from the Specials League, a league that was created specifically for combo projections that includes two or more players from different sports or leagues. For example, LeBron James plus Travis Kelsey at a 10.5 combo of three-pointers made plus receptions. You want to play alongside some of Price Picks' favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Scholes, so you can now find community plays under the promo tab of the app to view entries from some of the biggest names in the Price Picks community each and every week. Price Picks, they also offer Apple Pay for quick and easy deposits into your account this football season, and make sure you check it out. Go to pricepicks.com slash NFL and use code LOCKEDONNFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Once again, go to pricepicks.com slash NFL and use code NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. As we jump into the fourth quarter action on today's episode of Lockdown Broncos, just a reminder, thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day. Every single day. Just a reminder, you can get this podcast for free every single day, all year long, through all the season and the offseason, because for the true fan, there is never an offseason. Lockdown Broncos, we have you covered here. Thank you so much for making us part of your daily routine here. Sarah, we've been talking about surprises. We've talked about disappointments from the first half of the season here for this Broncos football team. And now I think we need to ask the question here, what is it that we want to see from the offense in the second half stretch where Denver internally, they believe that they can make a second half run. They believe that they can flip the switch and do it in order to do that. What must they do better or do more of going into the second half? I think the first thing they've got to do is really expand the passing game. And I don't mean at the expense of the running game. I know we just got done talking about how, man, when you emphasize the run, we're seeing the results, two straight victories and you're dominating on the ground. I want to see the passing game expanded, though, a little bit in terms of got to get some more downfield targets to Jerry Judy, right? We've seen the success when the team is going downfield now to Cortland Sutton in consecutive games as well. So in addition to the running game doing its thing, Cody, I mean, you look back at that Green Bay game, the big plays that Cortland Sutton made in that game, and you, you look at the Kansas City game where you're throwing it downfield to both Judy and Sutton and those two guys making plays on the ball. You've got receivers out there, especially with Marvin Mims needing more touches. I want to see an expanded downfield passing game for the Broncos, of course, not at the expense of the running game. Certainly don't want to be putting the ball in harm's way, but maybe more plays that are designed to be thrown deeper. And I'm not I guess I don't know, Cody, if there's if I'm just missing like or the Broncos are not able to get the ball downfield to these guys or what. It just doesn't feel like that's really part of of the offense at this point like there's there's some big shots downfield and the broncos are successful taking big shots downfield a lot of quick dump offs to the running backs that we've seen have success screens to running backs that have gone for touchdowns things like that we haven't seen much of a consistent downfield game where you feel like at any point you could target jerry judy or Cortland sutton eight to ten times a game at any level of the field and have success that's that sustained success in intermediate to more downfield passing has not been there for Denver, and I would love to see that more in the second half of the season. Against the Chiefs, Jerry Judy had five targets, which led the team in that Broncos win there, and he had two catches on five targets there. So I, I agree with you in terms of that. I think one thing that would help with that, Sarah, is just a little bit more balance, right? You know, Sean Payton told us on his Monday conference call following the Raiders, uh, not the Raiders, the Chiefs game, sorry about that, <laughs> the, the Chiefs game that, the idea is that they want to try to build up their play action passing game a little bit more. And I think that's where if you have the run game going, you can do that. But there are times where I wonder why, why does Denver just drop back to the shotgun? And, you know, obviously they'll have a back to either side and it's just, they'll just do a three step drop game there. And look, I think you have to have that in there, but I think sometimes there's a little bit more of a reliance on the shotgun passing game. And that's where you can do different pressure looks as a defensive coordinator to attack certain things, like especially if the Broncos' run game isn't working or they're not blocking well or just or if they're trailing in a game, that puts Denver, I think, into a position where it hurts. And I think a lot of that is you need more production out of the tight ends. And, and look, I, I don't know who's going to emerge here, Sarah. We talk about Troutman just being kind of you know a guy who's just going to be a, a key blocker for you, might have a couple of catches in a game, but it's not going to be really for any big yardage. Like You're not going to see him have over 30 yards receiving in a game, which I think is a little – it's a negative aspect of the offense here. 
I maybe we, we will see Lucas Kroll activated from the practice squad at some point. And look, what's it going to hurt at this point, right? Because what are we talking about, Sarah, when we talk about tight end? You need someone who has speed. And Lucas Kroll, he ran a legitimate 4.540 yard dash. He's got speed. He's got some good size to him. And I get it. He was the Saints' leading receiver in the preseason at that position. He had some plays, and Saints fans were pissed when he went to Denver. The idea of it, though, is to just do something different, right? Because what you're doing right now is not working. Like, you have to, at some point, have the tight end involved in the passing game. I mean, if we were going to sit here and say, okay, hey, Sarah, here's what the tight end position is going to look like for Denver going into week 10 of the NFL season, I would have said, why, do, why not just keep Eric Tomlinson involved and Eric Sauber if this is what the Broncos' offensive thing is going to be? So for me, more production out of the tight ends. And I think so much of that, too, if – They'll open things up if the run game is working. So for me, I'm a big proponent. Pound the rock. I think Denver's got to do way more of that than they have committed to. Agreed, Cody. And I think that that's going to help one of my final things that I think we want to see in the second half, which is efficient Russell Wilson, right? If you're running the ball well, I think that allows him to play relatively mistake-free football. But I think one area, maybe that's slightly underrated at this point, I guess. I don't know if maybe, maybe not. Maybe more people are thinking this than I'm realizing. Russell's got to do a little bit better job of protecting the ball when he's mm -hmm. taking off running, right? I mean, I think three different times this season, I've yeah. seen him take off one direction or the other, and the ball gets swatted out from behind. So we know Russ has those big mitts, right? He's He's got the 10 inch hands or whatever it is. The NFL draft folks love that about him when he was coming out. Uh, he's got the big strong hands to be able to hold onto the ball. It's just not happening. He's being a little too reckless with the football. And we've seen uh, too many fumbles, I think, from Russell Wilson this season. So I think his efficiency as a passer has been pretty good, right? I mean, he's not making a ton of mistakes throwing the ball. But he's making some pretty critical errors when it comes to, you know, either holding on to the ball too long and taking sacks or being reckless with the football when he takes off to run. Those two issues right now, when he takes off or when he stays in the pocket too long and doesn't just have that quick trigger, I think that's where a lot of the frustration is coming from from people. So is that limiting the Broncos offense enough? Like, can you really call him efficient when he's doing those types of things? The statistics say, yes, the eye test would say maybe not. So I think to, for Russell to be more efficient, he's got to be better about either throwing the ball away instead of taking sacks or when he's escaping the pocket, you've got to have better ball security and make sure that if you're trying to get out of the pocket, yeah, hold that ball high and tight and, and then chuck it away at the last second if you have to. Just be less reckless with the ball. Realize that somebody's probably coming from behind and they're going to be trying to get the ball out. So I know that's a lot of heat of the moment stuff too, but I think that'll help Russell Wilson become a much more efficient quarterback in the second half of the season. If you live to play another down. Yeah. Well, and I agree with you on that too, because I just think, well, I love and applaud how Russ uses his mobility to try to extend plays, right? Like how, look how many times this year Denver scored on the scramble drill, right? Which has been an issue for them in years past. Well, Russ, every time, you know, when he's breaking out and there is pressure, like he's looking for the guys that are coming across free and nobody's usually there. But so at that point, it's like a decision process is a guy going to come open and it has to be like a one, which is easier said than done. Right. Cause it's ideally, it's like a half second decision. Is it this guy going to come open? Is there going to be a window there? Oh no, I got to tuck it and run, but it's just about being aware. Like, okay, Hey, if I scramble and get outside the pocket here, I know. And I just have to believe that there is a guy, not only are there guys coming in front of me in terms of trying to hit me, I've got guys that are pursuing behind me that are going to try to knock the ball out or bring me down. And as you mentioned, that has led to some fumbles this season for Denver and some sacks. So I think just the general awareness in some of those situations has to be better. There's nothing wrong, in my opinion, with rolling out. If nothing's there, throw it away. Live to see another day versus losing five or six yards on a sack. I think if I had to maybe say that's one thing we want to see a little bit more of in the second half is just that efficient decision-making that you're alluding to here from Russell Wilson and Broncos country that leads us to asking all of you what would you want to see from the Broncos offense in the second half of the season share your biggest first half disappointments share your biggest first half surprises as well if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening wherever you get your podcast you can always interact with us on social media I'm on Twitter at Cody Rourke NFL also threads with the same handle Sarah Bettinger is on Twitter at Sarah Bettinger and you can always send something to the Locked On Broncos Twitter handle at Locked On Broncos. That'll wrap up today's episode of the show here, folks. But one thing we are going to do, we're going to continue our report card series. We're going to take a look at the Broncos defense, first half surprises, 
first half disappointments and what they could do even better going into the second half of the schedule. You can get all of that and much more on tomorrow's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos.